from Number 5 Chambers, I'm Richard Kimblin. The planning podcast now turns to our second part on planning appeals. Here, JCB, James Corbett Bircher, provides practical orientation on case management conferences, statements of common ground, and the potential course of virtual inquiries. Hello, good morning, James. Good morning, Richard. Super to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Now, you, I know, have listened to the podcast with Bridget Rosewell. Did you enjoy that? Yes, I I did very much. And as ever, it's it's very interesting to hear not only Bridget's thoughts generally, but specifically how she's seen her reforms uh, work in in practice and that she will have some ongoing involvement uh, with those reforms. Well, let's just have a look at some of the things that came out of that in the context of your experience at the coal face. Now, one of the things that she highlights is the key importance of CMC's case management conferences, which, uh, of course, help to sort out the where, when and how. Now, likewise, there's a real focus in this book that I've been stupid enough to write. I have to say that uh, chapter four wouldn't have been nearly as good if you hadn't been able to point me in the right direction. So I'm very grateful to you for that. With that in mind, I thought it was worth asking you what you thought this key stage does to hone and to shape uh, the terms of the main issues for an inquiry. So the the case management conference involves two crucial decisions. The first is the number of the main issues. And secondly is how they should be expressed. So the CMC effectively stands almost halfway through the duration of the appeal at a point where those main issues have already been distilled progressively from, first of all, the reasons for refusal, secondly, the statements of case, and thirdly, the main or the planning statement of common ground. And at that point, the inspector can therefore phrase what are hopefully succinct main issues, which of course may include familiar phrases, for example, impact on character and appearance, housing land supply, and so forth. And critically, that CMC note provided often the day in advance gives the parties the benefit of seeing the inspector's wording and they can therefore make submissions on that wording and a party can think very carefully about how it wants to express an issue in advance and perhaps even consider discussing it with opposing counsel before the CMC. And I think it's worth reflecting now just how far we've come. I always found it extraordinary that main issues were, prior to Rosewell, read out at great speed on day one, frantically scribbled in five different versions by the attendant members of the team. And effectively, the CMC, therefore, has made a huge practical difference just simply writing these down in advance. One issue, for example, is that parties can now ensure that their proofs of evidence follow those main issues and if therefore have a clear structure And one sees that opposing witnesses' proofs of evidence are now more likely to converge to a common structure which aids cross-comparison and therefore focused cross-examination. Moreover, where a second CMC is held, as is now becoming a more regular practice in the world of virtual hearings, there may be scope for further honing of the main issues. First, I would say in respect to the lessons I've learned from CMCs, including the second CMC, at first, the CMC is an advocacy exercise to demonstrate to the inspector that you're focused on how to address the main issues in a manner that will assist them. And therefore, in my experience, I've only asked for very focused amendments to the wording of the main issues for example, to properly characterise the nature of housing in a C2 case. Um, Secondly, a CMC is also a timetabling session. So an appellant and the council can and they should commit to one statement of common ground on each main issue, negotiated by the witnesses, and working at least to a deadline, at least at the point of exchange of the proofs of evidence. And my third and final practical lesson from the second CMC context 
which may be held very close after the submissions of the proofs of evidence, is that that is a good time to commit to deadlines for rebuttal proofs of evidence, which again will be focused on those main issues. Well, yes, main issues. The, the structure which one is able to inject into those important weeks before the inquiry, when the evidence is being settled, the structure plays out in everything that you're doing in that time period. And I, I completely agree with you that being able to identify what are effectively then the agreed main issues is fantastically helpful. I think that it may have the effect of allowing people to then go on to identify the issues within the issues, because main issues when expressed by an inspector are often quite broadly stated because they are often boilerplate text character and appearance, uh, for example. But within those simple words are often, in fact, fairly specific objections. And I think that it may be possible to get to a position, particularly via the statements of common ground, to identify much more precisely what the actual bugbear is, what it is that's preventing the development coming forward on this sort of approach of looking for the issues within issues. And it is to the statement of common ground that I wanted to turn next because Bridget made very clear that uh, she wanted to create a statement of uncommon ground. That's what she was after uh, and had little time for documents uh, which agree nothing more than trivia. And uh, maybe you'll like to say something about that. But do you think, James, do you think that this is ever really going to change? Isn't there simply too much at stake with with lawyers getting in the way. For example, just on Friday, I finished a six-day case, not an inquiry case, I was in court. There was a six-day case in which there was a 13-paragraph agreed statement by the experts, and it was so useful that nobody referred to it on a single occasion. Isn't it all going to fall flat? Well, let me say, first of all, uh, something of a confession. I am a standardizer and a technocrat when it comes to statements of common ground. In respect of the trivia point or irrelevance, let me first deal with that. The definition, the current definition of a statement of common ground includes factual information that effectively the other party could not reasonably dispute. So I don't see the occurrence of trivia in statements of common ground as a problem. Such statements of common ground may assist the inspector in writing up uncontroversial parts of the decision letter. And they may also be useful for addressing, for example, third party objections on matters which are not in dispute between the parties. But on the second bigger issue of ensuring that we have relevant and focused statements of common ground, in my view, the main flaws with this current statement of common ground process, which impede this, are twofold. Substantively, first of all, there is no agreed structure. The templates provided by PINs are currently very short, and therefore parties come at the process from two different positions about the level of detail and what needs to be covered. And procedurally, the second flaw, there is no set timetable for negotiation of statement common ground, save for a single deadline. And parties, I'm afraid to say particularly local planning authorities, can often delay the conclusion of the Statement of Common Ground until shortly prior to the deadline. So my position on this uh, is that I've, I've long been a champion of standardised Statements of Common Ground for particular subject matter, drawn up by committees of experts who work for a range of parties in the field. And I submitted this suggestion as part of a consultation response to the Rosewell Review, and indeed, I see that it appears in Recommendation 7 of her review report entitled To Overhaul Statements of Common Ground, a paragraph 528. And if I may quote just briefly from that. Yeah, go on. Paragraph 528 says, the recommendation is for new detailed pro formas on the new online planning appeal portal which drive a more structured approach and the clear identification of issues of agreement and disagreement for common topics, such as highways matters, landscape impacts, or housing land availability. And this is the key part coming up. 
the planning inspectorate should work with leading topic experts and other bodies who have inquiry experience to develop the online proformers and guidance. So that's the vision. And in this way, one can imagine that the experts could work on a clear, common structure which addresses commonly arising issues. So, for example, in the noise context, which I know you're very familiar with, this might include a requirement to agree the following. One, the background noise level at night time is either X, the planning authority's case, or Y, the appellant's case. Two, the effectiveness of mitigation measures. Three, the standard against which to assess the change in the noise environment. And four, the scope, effect and lawfulness of planning conditions. And one could imagine once the committee get together and identify what are the commonly occurring issues, they might be able to even further subdivide those issues for the purposes of the standardised templates. Now, I fully recognise that standardisation does not enjoy universal support. Inquiries raise many varied issues and the template will possibly fall short in certain cases. However, in my experience, the overwhelming majority of statements of common ground on specific issues would benefit from a more regimented approach, whereby appellants, the primary authors, and LPAs as the recipients and the consequent negotiators of that text, are told exactly what they need to include. And there might also be a series of other deadlines inserted into the timetable prior to the final deadline for conclusion of the statement common ground, to ensure that, I'm afraid to say again, local planning authorities specifically are not permitted to avoid addressing standard issues until very late in the day. Well, that's probably going to come our way, I suspect. I suspect that you're absolutely on the money there. Really, it's about having a good example to work to. It's about having something which is probably a halfway house between a template and a good worked example, or perhaps perhaps both. In the book, I talk quite a lot about codes of conduct and uh, professional duties and cooperation. And it does seem to me that there is something of a trick which is being missed in the inspectorate, in that not really enough is made of what is the duty to assist the tribunal. The duty is there in respect of barristers. The planning inquiry is a tribunal for the purposes of barristers' code of conduct. So it does seem to me that if a sufficient attention were drawn to the need to cooperate, as there is in fact in respect of the civil procedure rules and the criminal procedure rules, there's quite a lot of scope for putting pressure on parties to cooperate rather than fence with each other. But I think that would need particular intervention from the inspectorate and whether they turn their minds to doing that, um, we'll have to wait and see. They've obviously got quite enough uh, on their plate at the moment, having to sort out uh, such an enormous change in the way in which inquiries are dealt with. And Bridget did canvas this in some detail with me. Um, the whole topic of the merits of virtual participation is, is so timely and it is one that I know that you've been very, very closely involved with and I'm grateful again to you for the insight which you provided while I was drafting the chapter on virtual hearings. Much of that work, James, has been done with PIBA, hasn't it? What's PIBA been up to and what have you been involved with? So PIBA has been working closely with PINs uh, as part of an ongoing discussion on how to deliver virtual inquiries effectively. And I'm a member of a working group of barristers, most of whom are around 10 years cool. I think our title is The Working Group on Virtual Inquiries. Obviously, it shifts somewhat as the uh, process has developed. Uh, we have written a number of documents for PINs which essentially apply our imagination as to how things could work well and what to avoid. And in that process, I've personally drawn on my experience of appearing as a junior at one virtual event and my own preparation for my own first virtual event in my own right, which is taking place in two weeks' time. Ultimately, PINs must produce its own guidance for it to carry the necessary authority and, of course, that guidance will apply to all participants in the virtual inquiry process, including the many individuals who appear before inquiries and hearings who are not members of PIBA. 
as a consequence, therefore, the specific content of that guidance, I can't be drawn on at the present time because it's very much for pins to author that and publish that in due course. Obviously, in the knowledge that it has had input and discussion with PIBA as experts in the inquiry process. But I would draw out, for present purposes, three lessons from my work on that working committee, my own communications with PINs, uh, and my practical experience from my own cases. The first is that virtual inquiries are very time pressured. Uh, Three sessions per day of 1.5 hours each is becoming the norm, and that can add perhaps two to three days onto an average four-day inquiry. And therefore, cross-examination must compress accordingly. Uh, Secondly, virtual inquiries must therefore be significantly front-loaded. So uh, any guidance provided by PINs must require parties to provide information some way in advance of the inquiry. We've we've talked already about statements of common ground. There may also be uh, further documents that could be front-loaded in advance. Agreed notes uh, between parties, for example. Uh, Third, uh, virtual inquiries are fully participative. And what I mean by that is that they allow third parties and members of the public to make their submissions succinctly and with just the same formality and respect for proceedings as a live event. The fears that third parties might take over the virtual event have proven to be baseless so far. So as a rough guess, I would expect virtual inquiries will grow in popularity over the next six months, of course, subject to social distancing and government policy. And my rough guess would be that in the future, a standard uh, one to two week inquiry uh, may be heard 50% virtually and 50% physically. So non-site specific evidence might be heard virtually, for example, housing land supply, and then site specific evidence might be heard physically, for example, landscape evidence tied into contributions to members of the public and the site visit. Well, I'm really glad to hear you say that, James, and if I may say so, I, I quite agree, uh, not least in respect of what essentially you're describing there as a hybrid. I am a fan of the hybrid approach, uh, having done it on a couple of occasions in court cases, part video, part in court. And it seems to me that there are huge advantages there, not least for the participating public, because they then are able to attend in a way and at times which is particularly relevant to them, because one is so familiar with those occasions when people attend in significant number at 10am on the first day, thinking that they're there to talk about traffic or visual impact. And there then follows a couple of days of material from which, from the interested person's point of view, has absolutely nothing to do with their proposal uh, that they're interested in. So um, I think from that point of view, it's uh, potentially quite helpful. And likewise, in terms of cost, um, I think that we will soon see inquiry teams being able to sort out those topic areas which really do need the witnesses in front of the parties and the inspector so that the issues can be really dealt with with the quality of examination which is really needed and those which fall into another category which can quite properly be dealt with by a virtual means and I think it's that sort of thing which is really fascinating to see how it evolves and the degree of imagination that the parties and the inspectorate apply to uh, what has been this enormous acceleration in in change and and you've been tracking it uh, in such a wonderful way Uh, and I'm extremely grateful to you for what you've been doing generally for the profession and also uh, the interactions that we have had in discussing these topics uh, both here and outside of it so it's been a fantastic opportunity to go through that with you James and I'm really very grateful Thank you very much, Richard. It's been uh, brilliant to talk to you. And I've, I say, throughout my career, I've learned a lot from your inquiry style, including against you. And so uh, I continue to apply that uh, where I can.
<laughs> well, that's very amusing. Um, and uh, I should, we'll, see, we'll have to see if we can cut that piece out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Th- thank you very much indeed, James. Now, I, I think that a suitable reward for that fantastic input will be actually to start your holiday and get out to the beach because that's what's next, isn't it? It is, yes. Off to the beach for today for such sun as, uh, sunshine as remains in Cornwall and then uh, back to inquiry preparation. Great. Thanks ever so much, James. Thank you, Richard. That was the Planning Podcast, the second part of the Planning Appeals edition. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to be in conversation with both Bridget and with James, both real contributors to the modern appeal system which is still evolving at a fair pace. Thank you. Stay safe.